Tonight we want to talk about the heredity of the king. In the Gospel of Matthew, he is writing, it's fascinating how the Gospel writers have a different focus concerning Jesus. Matthew is presenting Jesus as the king of the Jews. And so we see things even with the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew that is different from the genealogy that you have in Luke 3. And the reason is there's a difference of the focus of what the, the gospel writers are doing. So Matthew is presenting Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. Mark is presenting Jesus as the servant. And you know what is one of the key words in the gospel of Mark that you see over and over again? Immediately. Immediately. You keep reading and you'll find immediately that word used so many times in the Gospel of Mark. So Mark's focus is different than Matthew's. Luke is presenting Jesus as the Son of Man. And so uh, and we find a lot more parables and we find a lot more uh, like the discourses, the different things in, in the Gospel of Luke that are different than Matthew. And there's a lot of, you know, the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which means they are looking... They, they may present different, for emphasis, different points of the same events. We've seen some miracles that Matthew records it differently than Luke. That doesn't mean there's no inconsistency in the scriptures. It's just a, a different aspect, a different view for the purpose of the gospel writer. The gospel of John is presenting Jesus Christ as the Son of God. The focus is on his deity. And so we see... Uh, and, and we even see this with the birth of Christ and the presentation of the birth of Christ. So since Matthew is showing Jesus as the king of the Jews, this is why you start out in verses 1 to 17. Verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. If Jesus is going to be the king of the Jews, whose lineage does he have to be in? David, and you have to find that, so he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now it's interesting because Luke is showing, in Luke 3, goes all the way back to Adam. Was that necessary with the Jews in Matthew? No, because Matthew's purpose is to show Jesus as the son of David, the right heir to the throne of David in that kingly line, and the son of Abraham. So Matthew doesn't go, want to go back farther than Abraham because he doesn't need to concerning the, the, son of the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. So we're seeing his human heredity, the son of David. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. You will see 2 Samuel chapter 7. God's covenant with David is an eternal covenant. God's covenant with Abraham is an eternal covenant. How do we know that? Well, we still are under the blessing of Genesis 12. You know, God bless the, those that, that bless, uh, you know, the, that are right with Israel. But what's he do to those that are opposing Israel? Curse. You have in Genesis 12, you have in Genesis 15, the land covenant, the very aspect of the land that God says, I'm giving you. And that was reiterated to the descendants. That was told again to, we have it with Abraham, we have it with Isaac, and we have it with Jacob, the patriarchs. And so now we're going to see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, the Bible says, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Well, that happened. Who was that? Solomon. King Solomon. The descendant that rose up, 
that would build the house and a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom how long forever so then you see forever I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me when he commits iniquity I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the son of men but my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul. Even though Solomon is going to worship other gods and be turned, his heart turned away from the Lord, the Lord said, I will not do what I did with King Saul. Removing the kingdom from Saul when he anointed David. That is the background. That is why it is so important for us to know that in history when we look at Psalm 51. This is the idea of when David is saying, take not your Holy Spirit from me, because what happened with King Saul? The Spirit of the Lord had left King Saul. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, he did not come and do and dwell the believer. He could come in, in power, but not the indwelling like we have with the New Testament. Like we have in the, at this very time. Somebody comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes to take up residence, comes to, to live within the believer. So David was praying in light of that, take not your Holy Spirit from me, even as he saw what happened with King Saul. Because David said, I've sinned grievously against the Lord. And so he didn't want to have that to happen. So we see this in the Bible. I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men, but my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all that vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Now go to Isaiah chapter 11. You see a prophecy that will take place and will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ will set up the kingdom, will reign. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Who was David's father? Jesse. So there will be a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We saw that in Isaiah 9, 6. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father. That's the Father of everlasting or eternity. The very aspect that He's eternal. The eternal Son of God. But what we see here, the, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what His eyes see, nor make a decision by what His ears hear. But with righteousness He will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. The son of David, here is the stem from, of Jesse, 
talking, this is the description of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's going to come and rule in the thousand year reign, the millennial kingdom. You, you see uh, examples of this also in Jeremiah chapter 23. So Matthew starts out to say, this is the record of Jesus. He has to show the son of David. This is the lineage. This is the promise. This is the covenant that's made of David and will be fulfilled. He's the son of Abraham. Go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. What the Apostle Paul will write. Galatians 3.16 Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. That is Christ. So you have the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Matthew is setting out to present Jesus Christ as the rightful king of the Jews because of the lineage of David and going back to the son, the son of Abraham, the seed. And that Paul later on would talk about. Well, let's look at this genealogy a little bit. We're not going to go through every name, obviously, but... We're going to look at a, a general trend. When we look at this genealogy, we see God's wonderful grace. We can fit right in because Jesus' genealogy is filled with imperfect people. Imperfect people. We have some examples. Notice chapter, in chapter 1, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Well, Jacob was a deceiver. He was deceiving, wasn't he? Jacob, or no, in verse 6, Jesse was the father of David, the king, and David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. So David committed adultery and murder. Murdered Uriah, didn't he? Had Uriah, a faithful soldier, a faithful member, and sent word by his own hand to have him killed to the commander. Everybody pull away from him, and there he was. And how Uriah was killed. Solomon, we talked about this a little bit, took an abundance of wives and concubines and turned away from the Lord and dragged disobedience to the Lord. The Lord said, you're not to be marrying these foreign wives. And he thought, well, I can handle this. I'll never turn away from the Lord. It's so sad because the same king who, at the dedication of the temple, was so humble, exalting the Lord, but what happened? In a matter of chapters later on in the scripture, his heart, he, he turned away. He was worshiping other gods. And some of the, I mean, abominable gods. And he was, had turned away from the Lord. You see in the Bible, in this genealogy, notice verse 10. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Ammon, and Ammon the father of Josiah. Now, Josiah was a good king, godly king. At age eight years old, he began to reign. Josiah became the father of Zechariah. But you know what? Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings in, in the whole uh, of those of the kings of Judah. He did all sorts of leading away into idolatry. Warren Wiersbe notes in his commentary about the genealogy, it is most unusual to find the names of women in Jewish genealogies since names and inheritances came through the fathers. But you know what? We do have the privilege of seeing some women's names listed in the genealogy of the Lord. Well, let's look and see. There's some unique situations. You talk about God's grace, but 
these women that we see and read in the genealogy. First of all, we see in verse 3, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. We talk about imperfect people. You know what Judah did? Judah failed to give Tamar his son to her. She was waiting for the son. Well, Judah didn't do what was supposed to be done in giving the son to Tamar. And so Tamar acted as if she was a prostitute. And Judah, you know, remember when Judah heard that Tamar was a child and he was irate and, you know, that, you know deserving death. And, and she says, the father is the one that these things belong to. And they belong to Judah. So you have Judah, but here you have Tamar, who posed as a prostitute. You have in verse 5, we know by faith, we saw this in Hebrews 11, but you have the, re the reality that, okay, Sam uh, was the father of Boaz by Rahab. And, and remember, Rahab and was called in the book of Joshua, she was a prostitute. But she ended up believing in the Lord, didn't she? And acted by faith. Ruth, we, we read the story of Ruth and a wonderful story about Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and, and Ruth's faithfulness. And Ruth came back and was worshiping the true God. But Ruth was from uh, Moab. She was a Moabite and came from a family that worshiped idols. But Ruth, was used of the Lord in a great way. You know, we, we see Bathsheba's name mentioned. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Bathsheba, you know, when I put this committed adultery with David, David would carry, because of the aspect that David was king, and, and we're not told how, quote, willing Bathsheba was in this, but what you have is clearly the act of adultery. And you have uh, that she even was mourning the death of Uriah, but you have her name is listed in the genealogy. You have Bathsheba. Obviously, Mary was righteous before the Lord, but Mary would bear the stigma of pregnancy outside of wedlock because who in Nazareth is going to believe her? Opportunity to open up the scriptures together. And Lord, it's opportunity to open up the scriptures together. And Lord, who's going to believe that she is carrying the child of God, the son of God. So even though Mary had done nothing wrong, she was going to have a, quote, stigma of being pregnant outside of wedlock. In verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Well, let's look, you know, there have been those throughout the ages said, is it a big deal? Is it a big deal to have the proofs of the virgin birth? And it is. Because, friend, if you don't have the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not have the substitutionary atonement, the death of Christ on the cross for us. Because if Jesus Christ was not born of a virgin like the Scripture said, what type of nature would Jesus be born with? The sin nature, the same that every one of us were born with. But he was not, he did not have the human father, the biological father, that Joseph was not the 
biological father. The virgin birth. I've heard pastors myself over the years. I, I've talked with pastors and I've heard them say, you know, oh, I, I, I don't believe in the virgin birth. You know, this, this is, that's miraculous. I had a college professor one time that said, oh, I don't believe in the virgin birth. That would be a miracle. <laughs> well, yes, it is a miracle. But you know what I've learned? When you hear about liberal theology, liberal theology is unbelief. It's truly unbelief. It's failing to believe what the scripture says. And the reason I bring up that point, it grieves, my, it grieves me because the overwhelming majority uh, of colleges, I was reading a, a, a news today of a, a Christian college. There's, it's sad, but even this year, you've seen so many Christian colleges have abandoned the truth of the Word of God. They have truly abandoned the Word of God. And then you have seminaries that are cemeteries. They're, they're, not, they, they're teaching not true biblical theology. They're not teaching the Word of God. And you know what? Those, I appreciate what Adrian Rogers said one time. He said uh, he was preaching there at Bellevue Baptist Church and he said, you know, it, it was telling, and this was going on radio and various things. He made the mess in his message. He said, uh, "If you find yourself in this liberal church, a church that was no longer holding and believing to the scriptures, he said, you should saturate that church with your absence." And he said he would hear people say, "Well, so and so was buried in the backyard. So and so was buried here, and and I can't leave here." And he'd say, "She would get up and go too if she could." The reality is, the, the focus was those that were no longer holding to the truth. So, one of the precious doctrines that the scripture teaches is the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Elmer Towns, I still remember very clearly what Dr. Towns was teaching through Liberty University on the back years ago when they had VHS tapes that I took courses on VHS. But you know what? Dr. Towns made a statement that I've never forgotten, and he's, dead, he's right on. There are certain doctrines that we should be ready to die for. When Dr. Towns made the statement, there are certain doctrines in our church history, in church history, there were those that were willing to die for biblical truth. There were those that were willing to die for biblical truth. There were those that died for putting the word of God in the language that we, could, we can hold and have. So what happens? And I believe one of those doctrines that we cannot compromise on is the doctrine of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says it, doesn't it? And we're going to see some proofs. I want you to see this. In the genealogy, there's important proofs. And, and, and this is under the idea is you need to know what you believe, but why you believe it. Because there's going to be times where somebody might challenge you. And somebody might say, well, how do you believe, why do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? And when you take them to the scriptures, and here I want to give you a couple Proofs of the virgin birth that is so essential to the teaching of the, uh, going with the atonement. Why Christ, that he would be eligible to die on the cross for us. First of all, notice in your genealogy, in verse 11, Josiah became the father of Zechoniah, Jeco, uh, yeah, Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. This is the time of the Babylonian captivity. Now, on your notes, I want you to see under number one, from the Tony Evans Bible Commentary, this is what he wrote, According to Jeremiah, Jeconiah would not have a biological descendant sitting on David's throne because of his own sins. Jeremiah 22.30. 30. 
It's called the curse of Jeconiah. It's the very aspect that God said because of his wickedness, because of all the things that he had done, he would not have a biological descendant that would reign on the throne. But we see his name in the genealogy. This is very important. So although Joseph had a legal right to the throne because of Jeremiah's prophecy, it would never happen biologically. Thus, Matthew makes it clear that Joseph is not Jesus' biological father, but his adoptive father. Right there in the genealogy concerning Zechariah. The genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another key thing is verse 16. It's a very unusual reading in the genealogy. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. By whom? You might want to mark this down. That whom there in the Greek is singular feminine. Singular feminine. By whom? So that cannot be describing Joseph, can it? It's singular feminine. Who's it describing? Mary. So it says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom? So the whom is referring to Mary, not Joseph. By whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. By whom? That is singular feminine, so it's talking about Mary alone. So that is a very important aspect of this genealogy. Well, let's go to verse 18 and talk about his divine heredity. So we've talked about the human heredity to show, because Matthew is showing Jesus as the king of the Jews, showing how Jesus would come and, and how he qualified to be in the lineage of David and the son of Abraham. But now let's go to verse 18. His divine heredity, you have the dilemma. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, the betrothal period was about a year in which they were considered husband and wife, but they didn't live together, and they did not have relations. And so this was a, in a sense like a trial period, and they could not, it, it's different than our engagements because there are people that can break off engagements, you know, it happens frequently or it can happen people can say you know and sometimes I always encourage people to to do their like premarital counseling earlier you know not right up to their wedding date because there's some things in premarital counseling I've seen this happen years ago uh, I have a different policy uh, my policy is a list of questions with scriptures and, and to be honest with you, a lot of people over the years don't like my policy. But to be honest with you, I didn't ask their opinion. I, I, I hold to it. I'm not saying that in a rude way. I'm just saying that it's important to me. And I ask at the bottom of the policy if they're in agreement to sign and date it. And I make a copy. I keep a copy. I give one to them. And I've had times where people were not truthful. I've had, but you know what, it, what this policy is? I want them to take the scriptures because it's based upon what does the scriptures say? What is the, you know, what's the teaching here? And I had somebody years ago that told me and said, thank you for the policy. I said, what do you mean? He said, I started wondering and I said, did I want this person to raise my little girl? And my answer was no. And next thing you know, they parted ways. But it was wise. It was wise. I've had people get mad at me. I've had people on the phone just hang up. We're getting married next week. Will you do it? I'm sorry. What do you mean? I said, it's going to be impossible to get 12 hours of premarital counseling in a week or two. 
You know what I'm fascinated by? A lot of times people would be more concerned about where they're going to have the reception. Where they're going to have the reception than where they're going to get married. And, and, and the whole idea of, of the wedding itself. And you know, the Bible elevates marriage, doesn't it? So I think we biblically need to elevate marriage. And so the reality was, the dilemma here, they're betrothed. She's betrothed to Joseph before they came together. They were faithful. They were in this betrothal period. They have not had relations. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Matthew indicates very clearly, by the Holy Spirit. So here's the dilemma. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly to give her a certificate of divorce, to send her away. I don't want to make a public disgrace of her. Brokenhearted, can't believe it. He's thinking, of course, that she's been unfaithful to him during this betrothal period. And he's going to send, send her away so we're not disgrace. Well, the dilemma. But then we have the dream. We've seen this many times. Bruce was mentioning in our Sunday school class this morning and, and noticed how many times the dreams that God spoke to various ones through the dream that, that we see this in Christmas in the various passages. Here we have in verse 20. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David. That's important. That's the whole reason for the genealogy. To show that Jesus is rightly in the line of David. Son of Joseph because of the official aspect of being in that kingly line. Even though Joseph himself would have been disqualified from serving because of the curse on Jeconiah. But what you have is in the dream, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She has not been unfaithful. This is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's why he came. He came to be the Savior. He will save his people from their sins. I like how Dr. Tony Evans worded this. A virgin would miraculously give birth because of the activity of the Holy Spirit, the greatest miracle in human history occurred when God became man. The eternal Son of God took on human flesh. And the child's name tells the reason he had came into the world. Why he came. I'm not going to take the time right now, but on your notes you might want to jot down Philippians 2, 5-11. Paul's rendering and such a powerful passage. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 about Jesus coming and putting on flesh. The deity, verses 22 and 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. That was so important. Matthew records that for us, showing fulfillment of prophecy, fulfillment of prophecy, fulfillment of prophecy. This was, this was prophesied years ago, and this is how it's been fulfilled. Jesus Christ did this, fulfilled prophecy. And you see in the Bible, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet. Behold the virgin. Oh, the liberals look at this. The liberal theologians look at this and say, ah, oh, the word for virgin here. 
In the Hebrew, it could mean young maiden, and it doesn't necessarily mean virgin. But guess what? Matthew is quoting from the Septuagint. He is quoting from the Greek version of the Old Testament. And there's a Greek word that means only virgin. Isaiah 7.14, quoted here in Matthew 1. The Greek word means virgin, exactly like it says. So we have here, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And you know what that means? God is with us. God with us. Almighty God, put on flesh, came here. Emmanuel, God with us. Heaven was coming down to earth. Eternity was invading time. You know, we're so limited with time, aren't we? You ever have the situation where you say, I have so much to do today, I wish there was an extra hour or two in today, you know, in this day. We can't barter time. I always kind of cringe when I hear somebody say, oh, I'm just, I'm just killing time. I'm thinking, oh, I wish I could <laughs> get some of that time that you want to kill so I can use it. We can't do that. We're all given the exact amount of the same time. But Jesus Christ precedes time. Do you realize that with eternity, he's unbound by time? What do I mean? What we saw in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The imperfect tense is before creation ever was, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But we see in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we would see it was evening, it was morning, and it was the first day. Second day. We had the creation of time, didn't we? But God is unlimited by time. He's unlimited. He's eternal. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, invaded time. <laughs> Eternity invaded time. He came and put on flesh. Well, verses 24 and 25, the direction. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Obedient, wasn't he? Obedient. Followed the Lord's direction. The Lord gave him the direction. So we've seen in Matthew 1 the heredity of the king. We've seen the genealogy. You know, we could all go back in our genealogy I have some real characters in my background. How about you? <laughs> and you know what happened? There were some people in the genealogy of Jesus. But wow, the grace of God that he uses imperfect people. My dad was kind of telling me a neat story last night on the phone. He was telling me, he says, there's this lady he saw at Genoa Baptist. And dad took her a picture. And dad said, I thought you would want to have this picture. Her grandfather was my grandma Groves stepbrother. And dad took her a picture and said, I thought you'd like to have this. And she says, oh. That means so much to me because I never knew him. I'd heard about him but didn't know him. It's kind of neat because my dad is kind of like <laughs> the historian in the family wise. I have a question I could just go and ask dad and say, you know. And dad was talking about, I remember the first time when I saw Carl Piper here at the church and, and I went over and 
and said hi to Carl Piper. I'd always, I knew his brother, his, one of his older brothers really well. By the way, I had heard his name but didn't know him. And when I shook hands with Carl and he says, I'm not positive how, but we're related some way. And he said, you need to ask your dad. And I did. And dad said, oh yeah. He said, their mom was Thurza Grove, your grandfather's first cousin. And she married a piper. And that was how all the, and, and it's kind of interesting. But you can go back and Dad was telling me about a relative that was going back a little ways and said, yeah, there, and said, this fellow was quite a character. He was not very good. But you know, we have different ones in our genealogy. We even see in Matthew 1 some characters. Even Manasseh, the very wicked king, of Judah. But God doesn't make mistakes, does he? As we see that in the word. So we can read this and say, okay, God's in control. He's eternal. And we read this. And it's fascinating because every time I read that genealogy, I learn something. And it's interesting, all the different ones, and how God was working in their lives. Rahab might have been a prostitute, but I tell you what, she came to know the true God. She had a changed life. And she's in the lineage. Ruth may have been raised in idolatry. But oh, she feared God and she didn't go back. She said, no, I'm going to go with you. And that your God will be my God, the true God. And I'm so thankful she did.